We are so delighted that you stopped in today. Our desire is to provide you with scriptural teaching to bolster your personal walk with God. I trust you'll enjoy the selection. May you receive it with an open heart and a spirit of prayer. God bless you all. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm so delighted that you are with us again today and uh, on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, it's a beautiful day. The weather's been nice. It's warm. And uh, we are delighted that you have chosen to uh, come back and to study with us and explore uh, the Word of God. Uh, I'm not so delusional to think that I will be sharing anything new for many of you, but maybe uh, it will be something that is a refresher, and uh, maybe I'll be able to share something that uh, may strike an interest to dig deeper into a particular subject. We just finished up the Bible study last week on the theme of salvation. Eight weeks talking about salvation, and uh, though it was not a... Um, an exhaustive study of salvation for uh, sure your time uh, what little time that I have and that you might have to uh, be with us uh, is not sufficient to even scratch that study of salvation but we gave you enough I trust you received enough to um, pique your interest and uh, to challenge your thoughts and to challenge you to think um, more on that theme. But today we're going to go to another theme that to me is of paramount importance. It is um, one of the, the, I would say, the uh, foundational theme of the Bible, and that is the Godhead, talking about who God is. Uh, if we want to have salvation, and we believe that salvation is from God, then we must know who God is. And uh, so we're going to explore this uh, study for a few weeks. I will say this, uh, that uh, fortunately I'm trying to keep these Bible studies down to about 20 minutes. I don't always succeed, but that has been my uh, effort. Uh, this Bible study I, I taught at a men's conference many years ago in Indiana, and I think I reached my my longest pulpit time in one session, and that was two and a half hours. But we're not going to try to get through this in uh, today. We will break it up in a little smaller bite sizes, if you will. But a verse begins in Genesis chapter one, and verse one it says this: "In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth." In the beginning. God. It's very important to understand that the Bible was not designed to be a scientific book uh, to prove any scientific matter. I do know that the Bible talks about the world being round, and, and that is a scientific fact. And there are other scientific facts that are disclosed in the Word of God, but the, the Bible was not designed to be a, a scientific textbook. However, uh, it, it is given to us to help us to understand some things. The Bible starts on the premise that everybody understands that there is a God. So let me suffice by saying that the Bible does not try to prove God's existence, yet it uh, talks about God extensively. Uh, it merely uh, states and affirms and assumes that his existence is already uh, known and that it is elementary knowledge. The Bible says that in the beginning, God, he was in the beginning. The Bible tells us later on in Romans chapter 
1 and verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul said to the Roman church, that the existence of God is evident in creation about us. Again, the Bible was not given to us to be a scientific book to prove his existence. It just uh, assumes that you and I can look out at the stars and skies, the leaves, the birds, the flowers, etc., and understand this was divine design that someone with incredible power and, and uh, wisdom and knowledge uh, created. And so Paul said that the invisible things of God can be clearly seen, even his power, that through his creation, of course, and his Godhead, his personage that he is. Uh, the book of Psalms tells us this in verse 1 of the 14th Psalm. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Bible even says that it is foolish to even uh, assert or state or to think in one's heart that there is no God. The creation discloses it. Creation reveals the fact that God is. One of the, the wonderful, one of the interesting things, I won't call it wonderful, one of the interesting things today is the, uh, the ideology or doctrine, if you will, of uh, atheism. Atheism is a concept that denies the existence of God. The reason why and the fundamental reason behind atheism is that if there is no God, then there is no liability, responsibility to a God. However, when we understand that there is a God who created the heavens and the earth and that he is rudimentary to our existence, then we understand that we have a level of responsibility and duty to that God. Don't be the fool. Understand that there is a God. The Bible goes on to say that God is a spirit. In John ch chapter 4 and verse 24, the Bible says this, and Jesus is speaking here, quoted as saying, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This dialogue took place in the, uh, the uh, conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well in Samaria. Uh, Jesus told that woman that God is a spirit. Amen. Luke 24 and verse 37 through 43 says this, But they were terrified and afflicted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now this is uh, a, uh, a, uh, the account of Jesus coming back to the disciples after his death, burial, and resurrection. Mind you, the eleven that would have been there because Judas went and hung himself in that upper room, uh, those eleven had seen Jesus die, had seen him put in a borrowed tomb, and they knew him to have been dead. But all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus appeared unto them, uh, though the windows were closed and the doors were locked. And uh, the Bible says they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they were seeing a spirit. And he said unto them, this be Jesus, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they yet believed not for joy uh, and wondered, he said to them, Have ye here any meat? And uh, they gave him some boiled fish and uh, some honey. That, that, that scenario right there is so very important because it gives us the understanding of the biblical definition of what a spirit is. Jesus there said, uh, hand to me and see, touch me. I, I, I am physical. I am, uh, I am perceivable through your 
uh, five senses of sight, smell, touch, taste, and so forth. Uh, he said, you can, you, can, you can experience me. And he said that was the difference, in essence, between a spirit and what was, uh, what was physical or what was flesh. So we understand that when the Bible says that God is a spirit, then we have to understand and deduce that uh, it means that God does not have any particular form or body or flesh or bone structure. Uh, and that is a critical thing to remember in your study of the Godhead. Look on into uh, 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 the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, let me see here. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There again, the Bible affirms that God who is spirit, moved upon the face of his creation. Colossians 1 and 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God? It's talking about Jesus here. Said he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 1 Timothy tells us this in uh, the first chapter, verse 17. says, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, that means he cannot die, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Again, we're understanding that he is invisible. God is a spirit. That's why he does not have any tangible uh, caricature or physical attributes that man could see with his five or perceive with his five senses. Uh, here again, John chapter 1 and verse 18, the Gospel of John. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Of course, it's talking about Jesus having declared uh, God. He is the manifestation of God. And Exodus 33 and verse number 20 says this, And he said, Thou can not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. This is the dialogue that God had with Moses on Mount Sinai. Can't see me because if you was to see me, you could not live. So we understand that God is a spirit. Now you ask me, well, uh, doesn't the Bible talk about God's physical attributes? And doesn't the spirit, scripture talk about uh, how how God is, uh, he looks upon, upon the face of men and how he uh, covers men and so forth. Yes, he does. The Bible uses uh, different phrases. Here, I'll give you uh, one if you, if you want. In Exodus 15 and verse 6, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. And uh, thy right hand, O Lord, hath this dashed in pieces the enemies. Again, in Psalms 91 and verse 6, the Bible says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Uh, not, uh, some, some would try to make a joke of that and say, is, is God uh, a bird? Because now the scripture is talking about him having feathers. The truth of the matter is, the only way that we can understand concepts is that they relate to the world in which we live. The only way you can convey to me that, that a, as something has been seen is that I translate or I comprehend that statement through the sense that their eyes beheld it or their eyes saw something, and so it was seen. So the Bible trying to under help us and to convey the work of God in our lives and the operation of God in our world has used words that we can relate to, and it is called an anthropomorphic phrase or statement. Anthropomorphism is basically attributing uh, un, uh, to someone, in this situation, to God, human uh, motivation, characteristics, or behavior. Uh, the fact of the matter is God doesn't have eyes as you and I have eyes. Does he see? Yes. How does he see? I don't know. He is a spirit. 
I don't comprehend uh, the world that he lives in. I comprehend the physical world that is, uh, that is uh, uh, understood through the five senses. Uh, does God uh, move? Does he uh, go from one area? Yes, he, he moves, but he doesn't do it on wings. We understand a bird flies, and so we try to use this, or the Bible has used these anthropomorphic phraseologies, the hand of God, the eyes of the Lord. We are the apple of his eye, one place says, Psalm 17 and verse 8. And all of these things are to help us understand God. But don't forget what Hosea said in the 11th chapter in verse number 9. I will not execute the fiercest of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. He's talking about uh, some uh, uh, pledges that he had made to them. For I am God and not man. For I am God and not man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into uh, the city. So uh, the context there is not what I'm trying to, to illustrate or, or uh, narrow down, but the statement there that God made through the prophet Hosea, God said, I am God, I am not man. So we understand that God is, and we understand that God is a spirit. And we understand that that spirit does not have physical form, does not have body uh, a body as you and I have, does not have bone structure, does not have skin, does not have eyes, ears, and nose. Though the Bible does use anthropomorphic phraseology to help us to understand his operation in our world. One other thing I think it is imperative that I disclose and share with you today uh, as a basis of this uh, continuing Bible study, and that is this. The Bible says emphatically that God is one. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Every good Jewish boy uh, can quote this. My dad used to be able to quote this in Hebrew. I've never learned it in Hebrew. I've heard it more times than I can remember, but uh, Hebrew is not one of my strengths. Spanish sometimes, but not definitely not Hebrew. But Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Bible teaches us that there is one God. Isaiah 44, verses 6 through verses 8. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me. Shall I appoint the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come? Let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So again, we find out that God is saying, you know, uh, I'm, I, there is no other God. I, I don't even, the omnipotent, omniscient, omniscience means having all knowledge. One says, I don't know of any other God. Uh, that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty clear and that's pretty definitive that there is no other God beside him. Isaiah 45 verse number 5 says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I formed the light and created darkness. I make peace and created evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Paul, talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy, made this statement. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And concerning therefore, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4. And as concerning therefore the eating of those things that have offered into idols, you know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. So we come to the conclusion and, uh, and uh, the understanding today that God is. The Bible is not here given to us to prove 
his existence. It merely assumes that you have looked outside at nature and have uh, seen his handiwork and therefore understood that God is. Secondly, we find out that the Bible teaches us that God is a spirit. And Jesus defined what that was, meaning that he did not have flesh or bone or physical structure, tangible, uh, touchable structure, uh, as you and I do, or as Jesus did after his resurrection. And the third thing we have discovered, and that is this, that God is one, and that besides him there is no other. And the omniscient God, that one omniscient God, said, I know not any besides me. And that just pretty much uh, makes that ironclad and finalizes that point. I appreciate you being with us today, and I'm, uh, I will, uh, again, try to take these Bible studies in short snippets. I would rather have short snippets that you uh, will watch and enjoy than try to get it all across to you at one time and, and you not finish the video. So uh, until we come again and join together again, I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you and that uh, you have a good day the remainder of this day or whenever you be watching this video. God bless you. Share us with a friend. Share us with a neighbor. Uh, look at our, uh, check out our website and, uh, and peruse around there and, and perhaps drop a comment now and then. We're always thrilled to hear from you. Lord bless you. You have a good day. Bye-bye.